If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Please rise. The is now in session. The Honorable Judge Bath presiding. Good afternoon. Please be seated. State versus Shire Good afternoon. This is scheduled for a trial on two charges, the Class B misdemeanor charge of driver's license prohibition and the violation charge of driving after suspension. Mr. Marco, I'd like to once again make the offer uh, to have you come sit here. Uh, I know that you are concerned with waiving jurisdiction, but if you're more comfortable up here so you can spread out the papers, certainly um, I would allow you to do that. I know that you're reserving your rights to appeal my orders with respect to jurisdiction. Uh, is the state ready to proceed? We are. I right. call the first witness. State Madam Magistrate. Yes. I am here under threat, duress, and coercion. I'm not here because of an order. Because you, as a magistrate, cannot make an order. You can only administer ministerial duties. You have no jurisdiction to judge your own jurisdiction. I'll give you the citations on it. But we're going to review something. And this is something that took place with my original, which I put in the evidence before our first meeting. You refuse to read it. You refuse to accept it. I'm going to bring it in again right now. And this is the federal government's public law 719, which mandates your compliance with the Uniform Commercial Code. You have not done so. You have denied me of it. I gave you part two. There's two of them here. Two of them here right now. Affidavits, which you refuse to even acknowledge or accept. They are on here, and I'm going to read. No, I am reading a judgment against you. There are two judgments against you filed with the Secretary of State. All right, well, Mr. Marco, what I'd first like to say in response is that you were provided two full hearings on your issues of jurisdiction. You have no jurisdiction, and I'm going to read the judgments. This one is dated April 12, 2017, which says, Affidavit of Commercial Default. This letter acknowledges and confirms as an other state there has been no response or rebuttal delivered to this office as an answer to the affidavit of commercial default addressed to the Honorable Christian Spath, Magistrate, and Teresa A. McCaffrey, Clerk of Court, 6th District Division, delivered by Richard Bartle and filed with the Secretary of State on March 28th. All right, well, Mr. Marco, what I will... That's number one. All right, well, hold on, please. I'm giving you the courtesy of speaking, and I ask simply for the same courtesy back. The first thing that I would like to say is that I have, in fact, read all of the documents that you have submitted to the court. I considered everything in my two previous orders where I denied jurisdiction. I understand that you still dispute jurisdiction, and the process under the Constitution when someone does that is to follow the appeal process. You will have an absolute right to appeal my decision. You have no decision because you don't have any jurisdiction. I'm going to read into the records, if there is such a record. Let me just finish. This first. February 28th, 217. Reference affidavit of commercial default. This is on February 28th. This letter acknowledges and confirms that as of this date, there has been no response or rebuttal delivered to this office as an answer to the affidavit of commercial default addressed to the Honorable Christian Staff Magistrate and Teresa McCaffrey, Clerk of Courts, Court 6, Circuit District, Division delivered by Richard Bible and filed with the Secretary of State on December 1st, 2016. Now, I put in sufficient documentation of sterile diseases which denied you jurisdiction and you refused to accept that. You come out with what's called an order. You can't make an order because you're not a judge. Well, Mr. Murphy, you are acting in an administrative capacity. I, I, I continue to disagree with you. The only question is disagree is the question of the law. You either obey the law or you are in violation of your oath of office and subject to RSA 92 call 2. Marvel, what I'd like to do 
right now is just remind you that I would appreciate your being courtesy to, courteous to me as I'm being courteous to you. There is no reason for yelling. You can ha continue to have what I would call a responsible and, and professional discussion. And my request to you, I have two requests. One is that when I wish to speak, that you give me that courtesy. And when you wish to speak, I will do the same. As long as we continue to be discussing what is relevant to today's case. There is no relevance to today's case because you don't have jurisdiction. And I understand that that is your position, but I, I would. You can't be so jurisdiction. You denied that. The courts have denied you that. Well, you don't have that prerogative. Mr. Markle, please, please allow me to speak. You have made your position clear. You have denied me my procedural due process rights under the Article 15 of the Constitution, and which demands that you show me the affidavit that makes me liable for what you're assuming jurisdiction that you don't have. And Mr. Markle, I want to see it. Will you produce the document that has my signature that gives you jurisdiction? Will you produce that? Will you, please Will you produce the document? Mr. Markle, I'm going to ask you again to let me respond. The remedy for the position you have taken, which is that you disagree that I have jurisdiction, the remedy under the same constitution that you're relying on is to appeal my decision or as you say, my non-decision to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. That is the procedure that the New Hampshire Constitution allows when someone disagrees with the judge's order. So what I am saying to you in response to your discussion is that procedurally, to get where you want to go, which is to continue to challenge this court or anyone else's court's jurisdiction, the next step is to have the trial. You may not even be found guilty. If you are found guilty, then you have the right to appeal both the issue of the jurisdiction and a finding of guilty. Procedurally, that is how the next steps go. When you talk about the Uniform Commercial Code, that has no bearing on the, these types of cases. And I believe and I maintain that I've made clear in my two previous orders on the motions that you requested that it is the continued belief that there is jurisdiction. Do you deny receiving an affidavit which incorporated the return of your purported judgment? Oh no, I received that. That's and did you did mind. you read what it says on there? I absolutely did, sir. And you know what the Supreme Court said, and I'm talking about Justice Grimes, in file 108, New Hampshire, 386 which was decided 1229 or 67. Did you read that? I read everything. And what does it say? I read everything that you, said, that you sent. And in the last batch of the things that you sent, you're referring to the commercial, the uniform commercial code and how a motor vehicle is a commercial good. And what I'm trying to explain to you, if you give me the opportunity again, is that those issues are not relevant to the charge of whether you operated a motor vehicle while your license was suspended or not. So that is where we have a fundamental disagreement, which you will have, again, ample opportunity to appeal to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. No, that's already been done. The Supreme Court has settled the issue in what I just quoted, where Justice Grimes states very specifically that RSA, which you're compelled to perform under RSA 382A 9-109, defines the automobile as consumer goods. Consumer goods do not have to be registered. Consumer goods do not have to have a, quote, license, unquote, in order to travel in consumer goods. Well, Mr. There's no taxation. You're talking about extortion. Extortion from the people who do not know that there is a difference between an automobile and a motor vehicle. I gave you all that information. You refused to accept it. It's all documented. The Supreme Court's already made the judgment. So don't talk about appeal because there's no appeal for something that doesn't exist. Well, that's now, you won't give us the last time I had the prosecutor over here deliver what was purportedly a license. 
It's not a license. It is a photo ID that I purchased. And I put TDC, front direct to coercion. That's not a license. It's my property. And there has been criminal conversion, T-O-N-V-E-R, that's what I own, depriving me of my property, which also has a contract with a very Hitchcock Hospital on it. I want my property back. Well, I've asked for it four times. You refuse to give it to me. Well, that's conversion. All right. That is conversion. Criminal conversion. Mr. Michael, please give me an opportunity to respond. All right. First of all, I have never made a decision on whether to get the license back or not. What you're arguing now is not something that is relevant to today's case. There's no case today because you have been denied jurisdiction by your failure to answer the affidavits of proof. Well, I want to see the affidavit that claims that I damaged somebody or I hurt somebody. I want to see it. Mr. It's my Article 15 due process. Mr. I want to see it. Can you please I want to be Article 6. Article 6 of the Constitution. You're going around and around, and this is what I want to ask of you, all right? I have made two rulings that disagree with you. And, that, and let me finish, please. Please let me finish. I have been very courteous to you, and I'm asking that you show me the same courteousness. I have made two prior decisions that this court has jurisdiction. I understand you disagree, and we can go round and round and round, but we're not getting anywhere right now. What I am advising you is under the New Hampshire Constitution, the way procedurally that we need to go for you to continue with your argument on what you believe on your side is to have the trial, then you appeal. I understand your position is you don't believe that you even need to appeal because there's no decision. But both, you, you should understand this very well because you are in the general court, both legislatively and by the New Hampshire Constitution, that's how your rights allow you to proceed. So what I'm asking you is to allow the rest of this proceeding to go as it is required to do, you are not giving up any of your rights because you will have kept them all for, for appeal purposes, and you will be able to file a pleading and an appeal with the New Hampshire Supreme Court arguing what you have argued unsuccessfully with me. And maybe the New Hampshire Supreme Court will agree with you. But that, we have to get through this proceeding first before you can go to that next step. That's the laws that you and your fellow legislators have made, and that's what the New Hampshire Constitution says. So yeah, I know what the Constitution says, and that's why I'm here. That's why my constituents elected me for me to protect them from the adverse and greed of the corporation that you represent. Now, I checked with Dunn and Bradstreet, and Dunn and Bradstreet defined you as a mere employee of a bankrupt municipal corporation doing business as a Sixth Circuit under the heritage of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, which Tony Bradstreet and the others also, the other companies that compete with Tony Bradstreet, to fire you as a private profit-making corporation, as you did, Supreme Court, under, under a contract to provide judicial services to another bankrupt corporation, which is the state of New Hampshire. There is no lawful money in circulation. That goes back to what I just showed you here, the Tax Lien Act of 1966, which apparently you don't understand or you're going to avoid the fact that you're compelled, you are compelled to operate under the Uniform Commercial Code. You are not doing so. Therefore, you're in default. You're in default of your obligation and your subscribed contract to obey the Constitution and you are subject to RSA 92 colon 2 for violating your oath. Here, now, here I've had enough. And I ask that you recuse yourself from this because there's sufficient evidence to show your animosity toward me and spread yourself to, 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 to what? Justify the salaries that are being paid to these corp employees. Right. There's going to be a stop to it. Are you going to recuse yourself? I ask you that. I am not going to recuse You're not going to recuse yourself. And let me put, put my reasons on the record. Please, again, I just ask for the courtesy of doing that. I, I do not believe there is any valid reason for me to recuse myself. I have 
I believe that I have been fair and impartial. I can continue to be fair and impartial. Uh, we are scheduled for a trial today, and I want to let you know that the trial is going to occur today. I would urge you to participate in the trial. I'm not participating in something that cannot exist. It is a total fraud. You have committed fraud by your silence to two affidavits. You've committed fraud by denying me my procedural due process rights under Article 15. And I would like to submit, just for your own, there are two pages here. Is there a bailiff here? What is it that you have? Serena Seas is after the Texas Act of 1966, which everything prior to that is null and void. That's what Justice Grimes in the Supreme Court case defined the automobile as consumer goods. Right, Mr. Marco, you will have to say, if you refuse to accept this? <laughs> Do you refuse to accept this? I'm trying to clarify. I'm going to ask you it one more time. Do you refuse to accept this? I am not refusing to accept it. I'm trying to clarify whether it's something I already have because I believe you may have filed it previously. Please, I am asking you to be a little more respectful here. I am trying to help this situation not hurt it. So if you can tell me what the title of that document is, I will check, but I think I may already have it. If you'd like to tell me what it is, I will double check. All right, well, if you don't, I believe uh, what I intend to do, Mr. Markle, is go forward with the trial today. I'm going to take your unwillingness to participate in the trial as you, you are voluntarily absenting yourself from the trial. The trial is going to go ahead, uh, and you're welcome to stay. I would urge you to participate. Again, you may be found not guilty. You may have, you have the right to present any evidence that you want about the situation. But if you, do, if you choose not to, you, you also have the right not to testify. But I, we're going to go forward with the trial today. You yourself mentioned that this has been carried on and going on for a long time. That was because I first wanted to give you the courtesy of thoroughly evaluating your motions. I have done that, and we're going to proceed forward now. Go ahead and call your first witness, please. State now, you were asking me to participate in the fraud. Is that correct? Well, I don't define it as a fraud. Well, did you, did you answer the two affidavits? The state Honor. calls Master Patrol Officer Padala. Your Honor? I'm sorry, you're not a party to this matter, sir, so... I require an appearance in a special non-representative matter, please. I, you're too late for this piece right now. Your Honor, I request that you swear the please. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and the whole truth? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Would you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Matthew Fidella, F-U-D-A-L-A. What is your current occupation? Full-time uh, certified police officer for the town of Upsom. How long have you been a full-time certified police officer here in the state of New Hampshire? Approximately seven and a half years. And could you please describe for the court the training and education that you received in pursuit of your career as a full-time police officer? Uh, yes, I attended the 151st class of the Police Standards and Training uh, Council Academy. Um, then conducted a, uh, participated in a 12-week uh, field training officer program from the uh, Upsom Police Department. And did part of this training, be it through the academy or through the field training program, did it involve the detection of motor vehicle violations? Yes. I'd like to direct your attention to December 14, 2013, at approximately 4.30 p.m. Were you on duty at that time? Yes. And what was your assignment at that particular time? Uh, Could you keep this? To take calls from dispatch, look for more vehicle fractions, and basically keep the peace of the town of Upsom. And at approximately that time, uh, was there a particular vehicle <coughs> that came to your attention? Yes. And for what reason did that vehicle come to your attention? Um, the, I observed the vehicle traveling southbound at a high rate of speed on South Valley Highway near Jordan Road. And you observed this vehicle traveling on South Valley Highway? Yes. And is South Valley Highway open to the public? Yes. Can anyone drive their motor vehicles on South Valley Highway? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, I would ask that the court take judicial notice that Sunfoot Valley Highway is a way pursuant to the statutory definition. So noted. Thank you. And as a result of making this visual observation 
of this vehicle traveling at a high rate of speed. What, if anything, did you do to further confirm your visual observation? I confirmed with moving radar, um, which displayed a uh, speed of 69 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone. 69 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone? Yes. And prior to the start of your shift that night, what, if anything, do you do uh, to make sure the radar is in proper working order? I test the radar with two to force to uh, simulate more vehicle speeds, um, and the radar was found to be working properly. And at the end of your shift, is there a requirement with regard to checking the radar again? Yes, I do the same procedure at the end of my shift. And on this particular date, uh, back on December 14, 2013, uh, is it your testimony that both before and after your shift, the radar was in proper working order? Yes. In addition to that, um, was the radar properly certified? Yes. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Okay. I'm not sure how you want me to handle the document. I don't know. What I will do is I'll ask the um, court officer to show Mr. Marple what is the what you're showing to the witness. Mr. Marple, uh, whenever there's a trial, obviously the other side gets to see what is being shown to the witness. So I ask the court officer. If Officer Padala, if you can take a look at that, do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize that document? Uh, it's the certificate of radar calibration that's used on that specific radar um, just prior to that date. And it shows that it was properly certified for December of 2013. Yes. Just ask if that be entered in the state's exhibit one, Your Honor. The only question I have is there is no charge of speeding. So it, there's not, Your Honor, but it's the basis for the motor vehicle stop in case there were a suppression issue. All right, that states in such a one. Thank you, Your Honor. And after the radar indicated that this vehicle was traveling 69 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone, what, if anything, did you do in response to that? I activated my emergency lights, changed direction, and initiated a motor vehicle stop. And did the vehicle stop for you? Um, yes, it did eventually. It took a little time to pull to the side of the road to come to a complete stop. Can you estimate approximately how long it took for the vehicle to come to a stop? Approximately 20 seconds. And once the vehicle came to a stop, uh, were you able to make contact with the operator of the motor vehicle? Yes. And were you able to identify the operator of the motor vehicle? Yes. And how were you able to identify the operator of the motor vehicle? He was identified by his New Hampshire driver's license. And what did his New Hampshire driver's license identify him as? As A. Richard Markle, they worked at 3431 11th Dartmouth Street in Hoxton. And you said his address was 11 Dartmouth Street in Hoxton? Correct. And do you see Mr. Marble in this courtroom today? Yes, I do. And to, uh, could you just point out where he's located in the courtroom and an article of clothing he's wearing for the record, please? Um, he's sitting uh, in the benches behind the defense table wearing a dark jacket. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant, A. Richard Marble. Now, had you would ask Mr. Markle for his license and registration, is that correct? Yes. And was he able to produce both of those documents for you? No, he was unable to find the vehicle registration. And when he was unable to find the vehicle registration for you, did he hand you any other document at that time? Uh, he handed me the vehicle inspection report. And what, if anything, did you ask him at that time? I asked him how his driving record. And what did Mr. Markle say in response to your inquiry? He stated it was fine. And did Mr. Markle provide you information indicated, indicating where he was coming from? Uh, he stated that he was coming from the Sonic Temple, going over a couple things in his head. And what, if anything, did he say uh, with regard to the speed with which his vehicle was traveling? Uh, he apologized for his speed. He stated that he didn't realize he was going that fast. And after that exchange with Mr. Markle, what did you do at that point? I um, instructed him to remain in the vehicle and I returned back to my patrol car. And upon returning to your patrol car, what, if anything, did you do? I then ran um, Mr. Markle's information through dispatch to advise that he was suspended on September 28, 2013 for failure to pay a court fine. 
did uh, dispatch advise you um, anything, any information with regard to the registration on Mr. Markle's vehicle? Um, yes, dispatch advised his license and registration were both suspended. However, dispatch advised that that vehicle is not registered to Mr. Markle. Now, do you recall what the weather was on this particular evening? Yes. Um, what was it? It was just beginning to snow right before snowstorm. The roads were covered with uh, coating of snow. And after receiving the information that you've previously testified to from dispatch regarding uh, specifically the license status of Mr. Marble, did you go back and have an opportunity to speak with Mr. Marble? Yes. And what happened then? Um, I asked him if he knew his license uh, was suspended. And what was his response to your inquiry? He stated, oh yeah, I was going to tell you about that. So he indicated that he knew that his license was suspended at this time? Yes. And did he say anything else at that time? Um, he began to explain a, an incident that happened uh, where he claimed that he was wrongly accused of speed in Northwood and um, explained the incident. And after he explained that incident to you, um, did you make any decision in terms of how you were going to handle the rest of this motor vehicle stop given the weather conditions at the time? Yes. And what decision did you make at that time? And then um, issued him a must appear summons for operating out to suspension, issued him a court date, and asked if he had any questions. Now normally, if the weather hadn't been as you previously testified to, what would have been your normal procedure? Uh, to take him to custody. But because of the weather, you chose not to that night? Yes. Did you explain that to Mr. Marple? Yes. And did you explain to Mr. Marple uh, what his next obligation was uh, regarding the summonses that you were issuing to him in hand at that time? Uh, in terms of court appearance. I'm sorry? In terms of a future court appearance. Did you explain that to him? Yes, I explained that he needed to appear at that court date. And what was going to happen to the vehicle that he was driving at that time? Um, Mr. Marple agreed to have the vehicle parked at the in his parking lot, which we were right next to that, and have a friend come remove the vehicle. Did Mr. Markle have any further questions for you at that time? No. And as part of your investigation in this matter, do you have an opportunity uh, to obtain a notice of suspension document from the individual motor vehicles? Yes. I'm going to ask if you can take a look at what's being presented to you now. Do you recognize this document? Yes. And what is that document? Uh, the notice of suspension for Mr. Marple uh, from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And can you tell me what address was that document mailed to? 11 Dartmouth Street in the city of Hampshire. And that was the same address that was listed on the driver's license that he had produced for you that evening, is that correct? Correct. And what was the effective date of the suspension in that notice? Uh, September 28, 2013, at 12.01 a.m. Your at this time, the state would move to have this entered as State's Exhibit 2, please. State's Exhibit 2. Madam Magistrate, if I believe I'm correct, if you ask me to participate in a fraud, I cannot do so, but I'm going to put you on notice of Title 42, Section 1983. You will put on notice for Title 18, Section 242, and you'll put on notice for Title 18, Section 241, particularly. And this is the action that I will be taking for the conspiracy that's gone on for the last over a year, justifying the existence of all of these court employees for what? 
I paid twice a fee for my freedom and my liberty as a result of you violating Article 87 of the New Hampshire Constitution and sending an electronic warrant to the Hooks Police Department who arrested me while I'm sitting in front of a computer at the Hooks Library. I was attacked from behind, molested, wrenched out of a chair, and I have a, a brace on my left knee. It was great pain, as well as back pain. Absolutely, they didn't absolutely destroy me. Not only did they, but they did it. And guess what? 2.30 on the afternoon of a Friday, knowing full well that if I didn't come up with the 40 bucks, that I'd be in the slammer over the weekend. This is all orchestrated with animosity toward me because I am revealing the fraud that your corporate government is perpetrating on my people. That's why I'm here. It's not for the money. It's because I'm protecting the people who elected me to protect them from the average and greed of your cooperation. That's what it's all about. And if you're going to continue with this, you will be paying the penalty, I assure you. Mr. Marble, the state has rested, that means they have concluded their evidence in this case. Again, you have the right to call any witnesses or testify on your own behalf. You are not required to, but you have that right. But as I know that you know, the state bears the burden of proving you guilty beyond your reasonable, reasonable doubt. But before the case is concluded, and I take this matter under advisement, do you wish to present any evidence other than on the jurisdiction issue? Do you wish to present any evidence on specifically on the state's claim that you drove on that date knowing that your license was suspended? Do you wish to present any evidence on that narrow issue? Madam Magistrate, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you going to accept this evidence or not? And I've asked you, what is it? I read it. You want me to read it? Oh, okay, I'll read it. No, Mr. Oh, I'm going to read it into the record because you refuse to accept it. I have not refused to accept it. I'm simply trying to clarify. Well, then I have to, uh, I have to you have to come over and I need to deliver it to you. It doesn't say starry decisis on the top of the page. I believe that's what you said it does. Is that the same thing? No, absolutely not. All right. That's all prior to 1966. This is after 1966 when you were compelled by Public Law 719 to comply with the Uniform Commercial Code, which you are not doing, and that's why you have no jurisdiction. You just got the evidence. Okay, Mr. Markle, I want to give you the one last opportunity. By your not. Uh, Answering my question with respect to if you wish, do you wish to make any comments specifically about the state's claim that on September, excuse me, on December 14, 2013, that you drove knowing you did not have a license? Do you wish to respond to that, that statement or that claim at all? You do not have to. But you have an absolute I, I'm not entering into a participation of a fraud. Everything you've got is documented. You will either compel, or you will either comply with that which you're compelled to comply with, or you will pay the penalty in federal jurisdiction. I assure you that, because this is not going to drop here. It's not, as I said, the lousy hundred bucks that the corporate government wanted to extort. The principle is the people that I represent are being ripped off for literally millions of dollars. Right, I'm going to and the Supreme Court in New Hampshire has stated, as Gustav Drive said, the automobile is a consumer good. As she walks out and is defeated by being the first one to leave the battleground. I want my property. I want my property. Are you going to fire it? 
Fine, thank you. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.